Well, good morning! <laughs> I'm so excited because I love to teach from God's Word, and any chance I get to do it, it's my favorite, but it's extra my favorite today because I get to teach at the place where I worship, and I think there's just something really special about that. You guys are my family. Some of you don't know me. This might be um, the first time you've actually heard my name. You might have seen me before as the weird blonde girl walking around. There's a couple of us, so if you get us confused, uh, blonde girls with glasses, there's about three of us. But I'm here. I'm so excited, and I'm also extra excited because my family is here today. So my mom and dad and brother are over there. And uh, I grew up in Dallas, like you said. I went to Plano West uh, High School and, woo, yeah, West Wolves. Um, and, but after that, I just felt this burning desire in high school to teach God's Word. I remember one time in 10th grade, I was doodling and thinking about how I could write a Bible study connecting the character of God with different Disney princesses. And I was like, this is really weird. Um, most 10th graders aren't thinking about this, <laughs> but I was. And in that moment, I really just felt God saying, hey, this is what I created you to do. This is what I want you to do for the rest of your life. And throughout my life, there were different moments in college or after school where I was like, okay, is this really what I wanted to do? But he just affirmed that over and over again that um, I love getting to watch God's word come to life and see what he does with it. Um, without further ado, we're going to be in Mark 5. And if you've been with us, Sam has been going through the book of John. And this is one story that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John. So I'm not stepping on his toes here. And this story is told every single time in a very specific way. It's the story of Jairus and the bleeding woman. And I know that there's a Jairus that's here, but we're not going to say Jairus. We're going to say Jairus. And this is Jairus. He's Jairus. There's a divide. But there might be a Freudian slip, so just forgive me for that, okay? Um, but in this, we see it's a sandwich passage every single time. The gospel teller tells the story of Jairus, and in the middle, we see the story of the bleeding woman, and we go back to the story of Jairus. So what do we do with that? We know that the telling of this story is important. It being told in this sandwich fashion that, that God is trying to get something across to us. So it's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, but let's go ahead and look at the story. Let's start in verses 21 through 24. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Okay, so before this passage, Jesus was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And does anyone know what he was doing before this? He was healing the demoniac. So if you remember the crazy story where the guy is possessed by a legion of demons, and they cast them out and they go into pigs and the pigs fall off the side of a cliff. It's a really weird story. You should read it. But... This is what we're coming from. So these people saw Jesus exercise a legion of demons and then go inside pigs and then fall off the face of a cliff. And they said, hey, Jesus, thanks for that, um, but no thanks. Can you go now? What you're doing is really weird, and we are freaked out. And Jesus is like, I just healed this guy of demons. He's thanking you. And they're like, no, no, no. But, like, that's crazy, so please leave. So they push him out. So Jesus gets back on a boat, crosses the Sea of Galilee, and he, when he gets off the Sea of Galilee, what happens? A crowd rushes to his feet. And when I see this passage, I think, honestly, of those of you that are parents, 
and you get home from work and you've had this hard day, and what happens? Instantly the little ones are like, hey, 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 mom and dad, can you help me with snacks? Can I, can I have help with my homework? Can you do this for me? Instantly. They're needing something, needing something, needing something. And this is what I think of when I see Jesus. He just did this huge miracle work, got pushed out, left, and automatically people are needing something from him again. Please help us. Please help us. For those of you that don't have families, uh, like for me, I live with two roommates. Sometimes you come home and uh, you're a little frustrated. Then they start asking you about your day. I really don't want to talk right now. You start to get a little short. Then it's like you have those moments where everything that something does drives you insane. Like my roommate the other day was running water in the sink, and I was like, she's wasting all of that water washing those dishes. How dare she? And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Why are you like that? So I'm always amazed in this story that Jesus has enough grace because if it was me, I'd be like, shut your mouths, you crazy people. I just keep giving and giving. But he doesn't. And instead, we see this man named Jairus throw himself at Jesus' feet. And what we learn about Jairus is that he's a Pharisee. And most of the time in the word so far, we've seen Pharisee, ooh, the bad guys. Oh, they're snotty. Oh, they're prideful. Oh, they're taking the word of God, not applying it to their lives. And lots of time we've seen people who are on the fringes be the good guys. But in this moment, Jairus acts completely differently than other Pharisee leaders before him. He completely submits himself from the moment that he interacted with the Lord. He fell completely at his feet. He was hopeless, he was desperate, and he was afraid. And in that moment, he put his faith in Jesus Christ. And Jairus wasn't just any guy, any Pharisee. He was a leader. He helped organize the church service. He was over the structure of service. So this guy with all of this huge reputation has been knocked out by this really small thing that is really a huge thing. His daughter is dying. He has nothing left. He's not prideful coming before Jesus. He just wants help. And he submits himself before God. And what does God do in that moment? Jesus extends a hand of help and says, let's go. Let's go. Let's go help your daughter. And in that moment, what we need to see is that Jesus does not judge people based on their outer structure, but on their hearts. And a lot of times when we say that, we're talking about people who don't have anything. Jairus had everything. And it could have been really easy for Jesus to um, condemn him, but he didn't. He said, I see in your heart your faith. And so he followed him. So our movie is going along. We're walking. Jairus is walking. He's like, okay, I've done this. I've done my desperate plea. My daughter is going to get the help that she needs. So they go. But what happens as they go? concert mob of people start pushing up against him, shoving, asking for help. And automatically, our, if we are filming a, a movie, the main character totally shifts. Whoosh. And now all of a sudden, we're focused on this woman. And we see her. Let's keep reading in the scripture. Verses 25 through 44. Plus a little bonus. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him to, uh, in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she 
felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving uh, in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garment? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you? And you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So we see Jairus. He's getting to go. He's in at a point of desperation. I, I don't have kids, um, so I don't know what Jairus is thinking, what he's going through. But in this situation, I've actually been the daughter. So when I was born, um, I was born with a lot of medical problems. Immediately after my mom gave birth to me, they rushed me off and started running tests. And for about eight years of my life, I was back and forth in and out of the hospital, um, in and out of the doctor's office, trying to figure out what was wrong. I had all these different things, and nothing was quite matching up. And the older I get, the more I sympathize with my parents as I watch my friends and other people have kids, this helplessness, this thing that you love most in the world that you would do anything for is hurting, and you don't know what to do. And there's nothing that you can do. And this is, this is the angst that Jairus has right now. Like, this story should be vibrating for us. Jairus is saying, I have to go. My daughter is dying. I found the solution. Please help me. But what happens? He's put on pause. And in that moment, Jairus is forced to wait. At the moment in his life when it is hardest to wait, God says, hold on. Why? Why? Jairus could have, he said, if you just touch my daughter, she'll be healed. Jesus is all powerful. He could have just snapped his fingers and the daughter would have been healed. But no, Jesus wants to teach Jairus something in this point of angst and this point of most need he says wait wait here hold on so let's shift over to the bleeding woman who is this woman well we know a few things about her one she had an issue of blood which she was continuously bleeding for 12 years which ladies in the audience i don't even need to emphasize how crazy that would be um, and men, hopefully, if you're married, you've realized that that also would be very painful and awful. Um, but for, it wasn't just physically that she was bleeding, right? And just all of that, just there was probably smell associated. There was a lot of just maintenance and hard things. But because she bled, she was seen as unclean. She was ostracized. She couldn't be a part of temple worship. She couldn't come here and worship today. She, anyone that she touched would be made unclean. That means she didn't touch anyone for 12 years. Or else they'd have to go through this intense ritual. Can you imagine that? Can you fathom that? Knowing, no one wanting to even shake your hand or touch you. Not only that, she was taken away from emotional community, people to care for her. She couldn't worship the Lord. This woman, also it says she spent all that she had. Every dollar she was putting towards hoping that the next thing would make her better, that the next thing would get her a little bit farther, that it would fix her. One of the things that I found out when doing... Um, research was that one of the techniques that they used is um, carrying the ashes of an ostrich egg in a cloth. And there are times um, 
I work all over the world, and so I hear about things that witch doctors and other people do to get better. Um, I had a friend who was ailing, and they took a hot pole and touched him with it, hoping that would heal him. And I don't know that that's what she had to do, but I know that she went to extremes, and she spent all that she had on this. But what does it say? She didn't get better. She got worse. This woman was at the end of herself. She didn't have anything to give the Lord. But in her moment of deepest desperation, she finds her way to the crowd and in faith touches Jesus' cloak. She put her faith in him. I am so need to hear this. Because so oftentimes I feel like I have to come to God with something. But instead, Jesus is saying, you can come to me with your lack, with your emptiness, with your feeling like you're, car- like you're a carcass. If you have nothing to give, it's okay. Jesus wants him to come to you anyways. You know, so often we clean ourselves up for the Lord. When all he wants is for us to come to him in our brokenness. We don't need to be anything other than where we're at. You know, preparing for this sermon, I was praying and I I was like, God, I don't feel like the most spiritual that I've been. I don't feel like I'm at the place in my life where we're closest. In fact, there's some days where I feel so far away from you. But I look at this bleeding woman and I see that God doesn't require that of me. What he requires is faith. That when I feel like I have nothing to give, I keep coming back to him over and over and over again. And that's what he wants. That's what he cares about. What I love about this story, too, is often Jesus heals people after they have given a declaration of faith. So you've seen oftentimes he says, you know, do you have faith? Do you believe? But not here. She's, this woman is healed before she says a word. Did y'all notice that? From the moment that she touched his garment, she was completely healed, meaning she could have snuck away and been good. Jesus gave her this healing before the interaction, which is a gift of love and care. And also, by touching his garment, she runs a risk. Because what happens, most of the time when she touches someone, they become unclean. But what happens here is Jesus is so powerful, his cleanliness is so powerful, that instead of making him dirty, he makes her clean. By a single touch, she becomes clean. He is powerful, even over our mistakes, our uncleanliness. God is more powerful than our messed up lives and hearts, and it's okay. His cleanliness is enough. He gives it and he spreads it on us. And I need that. I need that. So in this moment, I I just could say how much I love about this. But the next part, so what does Jesus do? Who touched me? Okay. Okay. God is all-knowing, so he's already healed this woman. So I'm like 99.9% sure that he knew who touched him. Um, And (laughs) what do the disciples say? Oh, my gosh, Jesus. (laughs) We don't know. 
There's a million people here. You expect us to know who touched you? <laughs> and you're like, disciples, this is God. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> Can we put this together already? No, they're just like, okay, Jesus, stop asking us questions. Like, let's go. This guy's daughter is dying. Come on. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Who touched me? And can you imagine this woman? I just like picture her like on her way out like, okay, I've got my healing. Now I'm just going to slip away slowly. And what Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Come on. In quaking, she comes. And she doesn't try to hide. She says everything. And a beautiful thing happens. Jesus calls her daughter. Let's read that part again. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This is the only time in scripture where Jesus calls someone his daughter. The only time. And he chose to bestow that title on someone who had lost everything. She was forgotten. She was helpless. She was on the fringes. Her family, we know nothing about her. We don't see a community around her like other people where they were bringing her before the Lord. She had no one. She had nothing. And Jesus said, no, you are my daughter. You are a daughter of the most high God. You now have the highest value, the highest authority, by being a daughter of Jesus Christ. You are no longer forgotten. You are in my family. You are no longer cast out. You are mine. This woman who had nothing now has everything. She didn't just get physical healing. She got emotional healing. Spiritual care. Jesus cares about our insides. He cares that we feel lost and we feel lonely. When we are alone in our apartment, crying because life didn't turn out the way we thought it would, Jesus is there and he cares. He remakes us. He renames us. And I need to know that. You need to know that. Even if you've been doing this Christian thing for a while, you need to know that even the mistakes that you've made in your Christian life are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The mistakes that you made before you were a believer are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The mistakes that you're going to make tomorrow are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we do not walk in that with an easy breeziness of, oh yeah, sure, I'm sinned. But we walk in this gratitude of being renamed because I know I'm messed up. And I need that. So in this, I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know if, like the bleeding woman, you need physical healing. There are friends here who I know have struggled with that. For me, it was many years that I felt like my body was my enemy. I wanted to do so much, but my body kept fighting me. I wasn't strong enough. Every time I wanted to do something, I couldn't. And I'll even say in that, um, I remember my dad telling me that you can do anything that you put your mind to. And like the love of a father, Jesus looks at us and says, even if you have physical ailments and you feel like your body is against you, God can use you. You are valued by him. He has the power to heal us, but sometimes he allows us to suffer to show us more about him. Sometimes he allows us to suffer because this world is messed up and I don't know why. We'll find out in heaven one day. Some of you might be going through mental and emotional suffering. Maybe you're struggling with depression. Maybe you're struggling with other mental illness. And you, your body is fine, but your mind is not where you want it to be. You want to wake up in the morning and feel happy and excited, but instead you feel like you're trapped. 
and you feel sluggish and you feel like you can't be the person that God made you to be. And God is with you and there for you in that. God gave us doctors, praise him. God gave us medicine. God gave us friends and community that we should use and see. But he also gave us his Holy Spirit. And we need that. We need him. And in our brokenness, we can come to him. Some of you, it might not be physical healing. It might not be emotional healing. But it might be a rift in a relationship. A Two years ago, one of my best friends, um, a guy even that I had feelings for at the time, um, we were working at the same organization, and I started to find out that uh, he was telling our upper leadership, she shouldn't be in missions. She has no business preaching God's word. He started to yell at me on the field. He started to undermine and betray me. And it was this moment where I would get so angry sometimes that my body would shake. Have you all ever been angry like that before? (laughs) It's not something common for me, but I just, you feel trapped and you feel angry and my body would shake because I was so mad at this level of betrayal. And that hurts your life. That hurts the way you go about your day. Eventually that um, man ended up Um, stealing from our organization and lots of things happened. That relationship was broken and I'm still in the process of forgiveness and what does that look like? But what I bring that up to say is all of you are going through something. Every single one of us are going through something. And know that you can bring that. You can bring that before the Lord not in this pieced up together, put together mentality, but in the brokenness like the bleeding woman. And God can redefine you, and God can help you and guide you through that process. And please continue to come to him at your point of most desperate need. And God will be with you in every step of that hurting. So... (laughs) We've had this moment, and it feels like this should be the climax of the sermon, right? And then I'm like, and God loves you, and then let's pray together and take communion. No, we're not done. <laughs> Don't go to sleep. We still, got, we still got Jairus over here, and he's waiting, and he's anxious, and <laughs> I don't know. He's, in my mind, this is my Jairus, he's bouncing up and down, you know, and he's waiting, and he's saying, okay, we have all this tense energy, and he's waiting, and he says, my daughter's dying. Okay, Jesus, it's so great that you're healing that bleeding woman. Like, woo! But like, let's go. Let's go. But what happens? Let's look at scripture. <sighs> Verse 35. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's home someone and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother, John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went uh, and went where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome in amazement. And he strictly charged them, no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So Jairus is waiting there, waiting anxiously, and what happens? The worst happens. Someone comes to him and says, hey, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter has died. So this act that Jesus did of running towards Jesus was for nothing. His daughter died. But what is... Jesus' response. 
Believe. Believe. Now, I know we're in the audience like, oh, yeah, like Jesus could do that. He could raise her from the dead. Okay, at this time, Jesus wasn't raising a ton of people from the dead. This wasn't like a logical next step. He was just like, okay, believe. So they went. And I'm sure if you're Jairus, in your mind, you're like, well, could, could we not have done the bleeding woman later? But okay, whatever. You're Jesus. So let's go. So they get to the house, and they see this crowd of mourning people. And especially as... Someone that grew up in Dallas, this crowd of mourners is really weird for me. I didn't ever really get it, especially, like, I feel like at our funerals, everyone's really quiet. Um, But I do ministry in Mozambique, and when I was there, there was, unfortunately, uh, a woman whose daughter had passed away. And when I came up to the house, every one of her family in the community were outside and inside the house. And this was not a quiet affair, but wailing, loud, loud wailing. And when I came in to pray with the woman, she literally threw her body on me and held on to me like a child. And I was carrying her as she weeped and weeped and just fell to the ground. And this kind of public mourning is more similar to what we see in the word of just this distraught in this care and it shows a value of that life so these people are weeping not knowing what's going on and Jesus says okay come on let's go and he takes in Peter James and John and another significant thing these are like kind of his elite three but traditionally three people indicated the legal number of witnesses So Jesus is about to do something crazy, and he has witnesses to show, hey, this really happened. So we get there. He's wailing. And we see this daughter. He extends his hand. And I love that, that act of vulnerability to hold her hand. And if you remember... Jairus in the beginning said, if you only touch my daughter, she'll be well. And not only that, but this girl is 12 years old. And the woman with the issue of blood had been suffering for how long? 12 years. This beautiful parallel. These two women. What does he say to her? He says, little girl, arise. And boom, she's awake. She's awake. And this daughter is healed and raised from the dead. And so this journey that Jairus has been on, he had a plan. He was going to go. His daughter was going to receive healing, and things were going to get better. But that's not what happened. Instead, something even better happened. He got to see that Jesus Christ not only has power over sickness, He has power over death, power over the grave. This is now an event that foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. This is amazing. And in this, Jairus went on a journey to see what God did. Jairus got to see God do something different than he planned. And I need to know that God's plans are better than my plans. Because I have really good plans. They're awesome. I mean, you know, when I was in college, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to meet Mr. Wright, cute guy, you know. I could start describing what I thought, but, you know, then y'all would all know my type and try to be setting me up, so I won't do that. Um, but Mr. Wright, and, you know, then we'd have two kids, three kids, you know, we'll even, you know, maybe we'll adopt kids, and we'll be this, like, missional family, and not that there's anything wrong with that, it's awesome, and those of you in that stage of life, it is the best, and I want to be there someday, but God said, no, that's not what I have for you, and I was like, wait, but wait, it's so good, 
like I can evangelize and I can like take kids to the park and then we'll be like, oh, my kids playing with your kids. Have you heard about Jesus? <laughs> and I was like, look, like the gospel can be shared. And, and he said, no. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Like, can I have something else? And he was like, yeah, I want you to go to seminary. I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. Because there's a lot of guys in seminary. (laughs) So I was like, cool, cool, cool. We'll go to seminary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go there with the pastors. Everyone is wearing plaid and has a beard. Um, And references really obscure commentaries. Andrew Doss. No. (laughs) So it's awesome. And I was like, okay, here we go. This is it. We got this, God. We're going to do this. I'm going to work at a church. How cool is that? I'll work at a church. I'll get married. Then we'll start having the two kids, and I'll be preaching, and it'll be awesome. He says, no, 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 no. I was like, no, but wait, it was so good. We had it. Like, we had it, God. Come on. He said, no, I want you to do missions. It's like, okay, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I didn't even walk around my neighborhood as a kid. My mom still gets mad if I go to the grocery store after dark. Uh, But we're going to do missions. We're going to go to these areas of deep poverty. So I shouldn't even be bringing this up right now because my parents, it's triggering. But no, I'm just kidding. uh, But yeah, so I'm going to do this, and it's going to be great. And, you know, maybe I'll meet someone, like, on the mission field. Wow, that's cool, right? And then I'll be, like, sharing the gospel with this person, and then, like, they'll come up beside me, and then all of a sudden we're sharing the gospel together, and then we look at each other and say, let's get married. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, cool, cool, God. That's amazing. But he keeps changing it every time. But throughout my life, what I've had to see is I would never be where I'm at today if it wasn't for the Lord. Sure, I want to get married someday. I'm not saying that I don't want to do that. I definitely want to do that. But I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, that I'm doing what I was intended to do. I would never have put myself in this job, going to these countries, working with some of the greatest people on earth, but I am. And I would have never had that dream for myself. And I know a lot of you are in this season of transition of, God, what do you have for me? What does this look like? And I don't know what that is for you, but I know that we can trust him. And his plans are good, and his plans are better, and he's going to use you exactly where you're at. And so let the story of Jairus bring you hope. That when you feel like your really, really good plans have been hijacked, that God has a better plan for you. That God is going to use you, that he loves you, he cares about you, He hasn't forgotten. If you are in a job that you hate, God is with you. If he keeps you there, it's for a reason. If he moves you out of it, it's for a reason. And I have to know that going into my next season, that God is with me, that he is there for me, that he loves me. And he is there for you in that same way too. And not only that, but when we follow God, we get to see things that we never thought possible. I have got to see God work around the world in ways that I never imagined. I've got to see people get healed. One of my favorite stories from the field is I was at a conference teaching with these women, and it was testimony time. And man, you do not get in the way of Indian women in testimony time. If you've been in an Indian church, you know what I'm talking about. And they're coming up, and it's my favorite because God is doing the coolest things. And she said, uh, this one was laying outside of her hut, and one of the big snakes, not like a rattlesnake, but like this kind you see on National Geographic and you never want to touch. Mumbas, anacondas, what is it? Yeah. Um, Comes up and bites her. And she lives in the mountains of India. She can't get help. And the pastor says, her husband says, I don't don't know what to do, but I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And I trust that God is going to heal her. And what happens? The snake venom exits her body and starts pouring out. 
I can't, I can't make that stuff up. And I'm not saying that it's going to happen to everyone. It, God has never done something like that to me. But what I need to know is that God is most powerful. God is most high. God can t- is in charge of everything, and he can meet us where we're at, and he loves us. So, reviewing these two stories, we see two people who are complete opposites. We see a Pharisee. We see an outcast woman. We see a man. And we see a woman. We see someone who was in charge and had authority, and we saw someone who people didn't even want to touch or be around. But in that moment, in both situations, what does Jesus do? He looks at the inside of them and says, you have faith. Not only do you have faith, because it's not about how much faith we have. We can't make God do something. But your heart is broken before the Lord. And in that moment, he saw them and he cared for them. He didn't just heal them physically, but he gave them a new identity. He did more. For the woman, he, he called her daughter. For the, Jairus, he, he healed her. He didn't only heal her daughter. What did he do? He raised her from the dead. A foreshadowing of what was to come. So, just to reiterate, when I look at this story, I want us to see that we do not have to clean ourselves up for God. That we can come to him in brokenness and in our lack. Don't try to be more than you are. But come to him and If you feel like your heart is like Swiss cheese, trust that God will fill in the holes, make you into cheddar or something like that. But you don't need to try to do it alone because we can't. And I think of like, you know, one of those buckets with all the holes and like our fingers are trying to cover the holes and then it just comes out the other side. And then before long, we're like trying to like cover all the holes, but it's still just pouring out. Don't try to do that with your heart. Let God be the one that mends us and heals us. Because we can't mend ourselves. And know that you can trust God with your plans. He loves us. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. He values you. He cares what's going on in your life. And he has a plan for you. And know that even if your plans get hijacked, and they're different than what you thought that they were going to be, that God has a purpose for them, and loves you, and has a plan for that. So let's just sit back and be along for the ride. I'm tired of struggling, of trying to make my plans fit into the God-sized hole when God says, we're doing something completely different, girl. And so every day, just coming to him in surrender, saying, God, I don't know what you want from me. But I'm going to take one more step. Like Jairus, I might be shaking and being like, okay, what's going to happen? But I'm going to keep coming to you over and over and over and over again. But when we do that, we get to see things that are better than we ever imagined. God uses us in unique ways. We get to see ourselves grow in incredible ways. And we get to see God impact the lives of others. So as we get ready to take the elements. I want you to come before the Lord not feeling like you have to put on a show, but instead, in your emptiness, in your brokenness, in your nothing, coming before him and saying, I know that I'm not enough. I know that I can't fix it and make it better, but you can, and I love you, and I trust you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you show us that we don't have to be something other than who we are, that we don't have to pretty ourselves up, that we don't have to diminish our struggling. But, Lord, we can say this is messed up. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm upset. And I need you. I need you to make this better. Lord, I need you to be our comforter. 
And Lord, I thank you that when we are alone and we feel forgotten, that you are there with us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is there to care for us, to mend our hearts, to mend our bodies, to mend our minds. Lord, I pray that each of us can keep coming to you over and over again, even when we feel like we have nothing to give, trusting that your Holy Spirit is more than enough. Lord, as we go into this week, let us surrender our plans to you. Surrender what we have, what we think is good, what we think is right, and to just walk a step at a time, guided by you, knowing that your plans are better anyways. And Lord, I just pray that in this church family that we can be a community for each other as we live our faith together and that we can care for each other and lift each other up. We surrender our lives and our hearts to you.